So namaste and welcome, Sarja. Uh, thank you so much for being on Ahimsa Conversations. Um, so you grew up in a country that was going through really brutal turmoil and violence. But do you have any early memories of the idea of nonviolence? Uh, actually, I do. Uh, namaste, uh, Ranji. Uh, uh, always great to start conversation with a uh, with a uh, with a uh, way my kids her online yoga classes. Uh, <laughs> uh, good to talk to you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Sergej Popovich. Uh, I was born in in a beautiful country called Yugoslavia, once part of non-aligned movements, which later, through the six bloody civil wars split it into six uh, different small countries uh, and uh, yes actually non-violence and anti-colonial struggle was the part of school curriculum so believe it or not the young yugoslavs at the age of you know kindergarten or a little bit later elementary school would learn and be inspired by the lectures from india and Gandhi struggle, as well as a civil rights movement and various anti-colonial movements in Africa. So despite our geographical location and uh, uh, widely held belief that Yugoslavia was behind the Iron Curtain, uh, actually it was pretty open in educational manner. So uh, having this idea that mobilizing people for change, uh, starting small but dreaming big, achieving things through mass action and uh, sticking to nonviolent discipline was a part of our education, which I would highly recommend to the schools across the globe. So regardless of the of the later violent history of the region, uh, Yugoslavia, well, my country, which is now named Serbia, got involved in the civil war. About the age I was 18, I was already kind of pre-shaped in believing that the nonviolence is a far more effective, humane, and ethical path to the change. And yet, it must have taken a great deal of inner resources to stay with that belief when you saw what was happening around you. Because as you say, you were just coming out of your teenage years uh, when that horrific civil war uh, you know, tore apart your society. So how did you hang on to that uh, faith or, or that conviction? And, and what drew you to political action? Because as you have written in your books, you were far more interested in music. I was definitely far more interested in music and biology. At the age of 18, I was a teenager, uh, playing bass guitar in a rock band uh, with semi-success and uh, 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 st starting my studies at university on Belgrade. And uh, as many people around the globe, uh, I'm an activist from necessity. Mm -hmm. So here you are growing in a decent middle-class living country. Uh, relatively open, Yugoslavia was one-party system, but it was culturally and socially really open. Uh, I grew up in a middle class family. Both of my parents were Top Gun journalists on a, on a national TV. Uh, and uh, around the age of, of 18, here you are, your country is falling apart. The places you have been visiting for a summer vacation are turned into the war zones. Uh, the nations and ethnicities uh, you were grown to uh, think as about the brothers, namely Croats and Bosnians and Slovenians. Are, are actually becoming enemies in a TV news. And uh, worst case scenario, you'll be given a gun to go and shoot into them. The best case scenario, you will leave the country to avoid the military draft uh, with hundreds and thousands of my peers uh, either getting involved in wars, uh, drafted for war or leaving country, including my own elder brother who emigrated and lived in Italy for the next 20 years. Uh, you have only two choices to fight or to flee. And I guess I was the, the, my generation was the stubborn part of this. So we decided to stand back and fight, uh, not being ready for our country to be taken. 
uh, from us. Uh, in terms of violence, non-violence, once again, uh, uh, this was the part of the population in Serbia which was very much opposed to wars. And uh, it has nothing to do with, uh, with ideology or, or, or uh, religion. It has a lot to do with the fact that it was the war, it was the violence, it was the hate speech, which was killing the thing that we were growing uh, with. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, from Serbian student movement that I was a part of, started in 991 after the large opposition demonstrations, uh, then grew into uh, uh, its own thing in 992 with a large anti-war protests in a campus very much looking like 1960s in the US. And uh, peace, uh, nonviolence, uh, solving problems through dialogue was a very much part of the culture of this movement. So uh, because the Serbian youth movement grew out of anti-war student movement, uh, and because uh, violence, people in uniforms, uh, hate speech, threatening somebody by guns, was considered to be everything but cool in my generation, I think the nonviolent struggle was uh, the only logical path uh, looking into movement growth uh, uh, it sparked in 91 92 went through hibernation revamp at 996 97 after the milosevic the serbian dictator lost local elections and then decided not to recognize results so this was the election fraud as a trigger uh, grew over territory serbia comparing to India is ridiculously small country. It's a 7 million country, but still uh, having the large demonstrations over the scope of the three months during the harsh winter of 96, 97 uh, in a 35 different cities and towns day by day by day by day, 100 days, I really got a lot of wide spectrum of population involved, uh, really sparked some amazing ideas and was really educational in terms of both strategy and tactics. These demonstrations sparked the generation that launched the Serbian resistance movement in 1998. These demonstrations also taught the wider population that if you have the mass nonviolent uprising, even the harsh dictator need to comply to you at the end of the road. So 96-97 was, was important in spreading outside of the campuses and outside of the very small echo chamber of uh, students, liberals, educated uh, big cities population into the wider population of Serbia, which once again was considered to be Milosevic's stronghold and was, uh, was fundamental in creating out for a national movement which had become in, in late 999, grew to 30, 40,000 daily active people. It's a huge percentage of the Serbian 7 million population. And then eventually uh, win elections in 2000 and defend victory from another election fraud and, and saying goodbye uh, to the bad guy by sending him to the war right tribunal in Hank. Mm. You chose a black fist as the symbol, meaning the, the, the movement, I don't mean you personally, uh, chose a black fist as the symbol of the Otpor resistance. Was this a way of distinguishing nonviolence from passive resistance? Uh, basically, the fist uh, was, was uh, chosen as, a, well, first of all, when you, when you take a look at the uh, symbols and movement identity, uh, branding movement, having a clear design of what you represent, connecting this design to the message, and also making the gesture made a, made a lot of sense. Uh, the clenched fist uh, of Otpor, which was later replicated in places like Georgia, Ukraine, or Egypt, uh, was coming from the idea that uh, we, the normal people of Serbia that were sick and tired of Milosevic rule, were the majority but very atomized majority. So the idea of the fist has less to do well. It looks badly, also looks cocky, looks like, you know, we want to fight. But the idea was coming from a slogan, which was saying, you know, it's like, get yourself together, like in the fist and live the resistance. And that was meaning get all the atomized part of society together, but also get yourself together, 
because if you're living in a country which is falling apart, bombarded by the nationalist propaganda, you lose yourself. So it has to do with yourself and with ourselves, uh, if you want, in a wider context. Uh, Fist itself wasn't designed to be black. It was also white. But the colors of Otpor, black and white, were clearly showing that there is no middle path. You are either supporting this, this lunacy or you are against. So the black and white design, you could find the pieces where, where, where fist is black, you can find the t-shirt where fist is white. Doesn't really matter the color of the fist, but the colors of the resistance movement were aimed to say that the reason why this guy is staying in power is that the middle of society don't want to involve. And I think this is also the message of, of how we became successful and lately, later becomes a part of our, of our curriculum. And actually the first thing you do when you come on one of the Canvas workshops, you're mapping the society and you're looking the side which is towards the change, you're looking the side which is towards the status quo and you learn that winning by numbers and this is the nonviolent movement can win only by engaging the large numbers. The large numbers are lying in the middle and this is gray zone where people see the things or don't see the things or don't think that the think that the, the things matter to them. How do you get these people actively involved in your movement? So in a way, uh, picking the black and white was also a message that uh, you are either pro and against. It paved the path for election victory in 2000. Elections in 2000 were not about the political candidates. It was the referendum on on this one single guy who was ruling us for a 10 years at a point, uh, but also looking into wider educational meaning of these colors. Uh, that means you need to involve people to get active. You need to show them that uh, it won't happen uh, without them and it, you need to, to mobilize the larger portion of societies into this struggle and these larger portion of societies, the, their main reason aside of the fear, which is one of the important reasons why people stay passive in dictatorship is apathy. And if you take a look at the contemporary dictatorships or contemporary leaning dictatorships, a majority of disengaged people are not disengaged very rarely they're disengaged of fear and you can take a look at the very brutal regimes of burma or north korea where people don't get involved because they're afraid but mostly like in russia for example people don't care or they go with the flow or they think they can't change things so the major main engine of status quo if you want in countries like india is uh, taking a look at the part of the population. So oh, this is politics. I don't get involved in politics. So how to engage this portion of the population in struggle, how to make these people from neutral into passive support, how to offer them call to action. So aside of just them being aware that things are wrong, you give them something to do about the fact that things are wrong. Uh, this is basically the philosophy of successful movements. Uh, I must say we didn't know that when we when we were playing with black and white. Black and white was more of an artistic and designer's answer to the situation, but it can be applicable to the whole philosophy. Hmm. To what extent were Gandhi or Jean Sharp, uh, either or both of them, somewhere in the background in all this? Either well, they have they, these two these two amazing gentlemen are playing uh, important and very different roles in both uh, Serbian movement and the worldwide uh, movement. Uh, Gandhi is, of course, an icon uh, because of so many reasons. And uh, uh, he can be studied as a great strategist. He can be studied as a less successful negotiator. He can be studied as a person who imposed the large self-sacrifice. Uh, lately, we are studying we are studying Gandhi and the center of something which is really interesting developing phenomenon, which is how you put your opponent in a dilemma. And actually, the first widely documented case of dilemma action is a salt march, which is where you pick a widely held belief and build strategically around the widely held belief. And then you put your opponent between the rock and the hard place. Uh, last year, we published a book called Pranksters versus Autocrats, looking into 40 cases of dilemma actions across the globe. Yeah. Uh, 
last week we got we got results from the research looking into 300 dilemma action cases across the globe so you can take a look at the gandhi from various perspectives aside of just being a great leader and great philosopher and later the pretty decent statesman of the of the newly developed country uh taking a look into into impact of gandhi i think uh, one way to take a look at it is uh here is this david who won against the goliath and i mm -hmm. think this is one of the one of the things i mean what this guy was like what 150 pounds something like me like if the wind is very strong he would need the bricks in his pockets not to fly uh taking a look at into how one strategic person can mobilize a group and then how this group grows, taking a look into the wider spectrum of, of his strategic thinking. And this is something the movements lack very often. We fortunately learn it by doing in Serbia. But understanding that there is this big goal we are fighting for where this is kicking out Brits of India, or this is getting rid of Milosevic, or this is getting rid of, of Burmese junta, uh, and taking a look at the small achievable victories as the way to grow your movement. So taking a look at the Gandhi as a strategist, this is his particular contribution to the field is less in, in his uh, almost uh, religious superhuman emanation charisma. And from my perspective, it's more into understanding we will screw up the Brits monopolies, but we'll, we will screw up the salt first. So understanding that thinking big comes with a zillion of small steps and the way to overthrow dictatorship, the way to overthrow colonialism or the way to uh, overwhelm any kind of, of very powerful opponent that you're fighting goes through the thousand small wounds, not through one big concentration battle. And I mean, this is once again, the big difference between the violence and nonviolence. Uh, also important part of Gandhi's philosophy, which you can see implied across the globe, uh, was this uh, drawn from his famous sentence, uh, uh, which of course I will quote wrongly, uh, the Brits are ruling us for their own interests, so why we are enabling them to do that. So this idea that large things can be done, not only through direct action and process, but through non-cooperation. It was non-cooperation that broke uh, anti-apartheid regime in South Africa, the combination of external sanctions and people not buying stuff. You want to take a look at the news, Google in uh, Myanmar Brewing Factory, one of the main sources of staying power for Burmese junta is the big co corporations and companies owned by the, by the generals. So recently, the combination of external pressure made a large uh, Japanese brewery, Asahi, divest from the Burmese largest brewery, and then by people of Burma boycotting that brand of beer, imposed two thirty million dollars lost on this company. It filed for bankruptcy in November this year. Once again, go back to Gandhi and take a look at how the mass non-cooperation, and once again, what comes with the mass non-cooperation and this is uh, outlining the, this type of philosophy, it's very difficult to oppress. So you may kill me if I'm carrying a transparent on the street and demonstrating in front of the presidential palace, but by no means you can make me buy salt or buy certain type of beer. And if you kill me, I'm still not buying. So it's like, you, you know, it's like uh, the, no way that you can make me do things that I don't want to cooperate with. And I think all of this outlined the uh, Gandhi's strategic impact, once again, aside of being a very inspirational figure. Taking a look into Gene Sharp, Gene Sharp is that guy who took a look in the history and kind of put all of this philosophy of nonviolent mass resistance into a scientific and a little bit more understandable way. And uh, his writings, uh, his systematization of the field were crucial to the whole branch of science. Now, now, like comparing to 20 years ago, you have bulks of scientists researching into protests, researching into nonviolent social change. And uh, uh, Gene Sharp can be called the father of the science in this 
times. He was also a very, very interesting uh, human being. I was, I was blessed of knowing him, being called his friend. He loved what we've done. We've met uh, several times. And part of what Canvas, my organization, is doing is making this thing that starts with Gandhi's philosophy, continues with a gene sharp scientific and strategic approach mm -hmm. into, you know, nonviolent movement for dummies. So how you make this user friendly, how you equip people with tools that enable them to do this at home, uh, whether they are fighting the, whether they are fighting the, the large dictatorship, whether they are fighting the colonialism, or they are fighting the, the small thing like, you know, somebody's taking off your farm. In 2009, you've written about how some young Egyptians, I think 15 young Egyptians sought you out. They came all the way to Serbia to learn from the outboard movement. And then of course the rest is history and that your movement and Gene Sharp's, I think pretty active intervention shaped the Arab Spring. Um, but today when we look back, at least on the Egyptian story, how do we deal with it? Because it is a success at that time and Look where we are today. So how do you cope with that? Well, I mean, uh, yes, uh, we, we, we worked with probably 70 groups across the globe. And uh, uh, we work with some young Egyptians, namely from April 6th and Kefaya movement. And this was the very important portion of overall uh, Egyptian uprising as a young, educated, internet savvy, urban, secular kids were one of the three sections of overall Egyptian movement, another one being Muslim Brotherhood and more conservative rural religious part of the population, the third part of the population being Coptic Christians. Uh, speaking about, about Egypt and Arab Spring, this is probably the very important uh, uh, thing and very common topic. Uh, to understand uh, how movements work, you also must understand why movements fail. And as Klausowicz teaches us, uh, if you lose a battle, it's a defeat, only if you don't learn something from it. And uh, taking a look into why movements fail, uh, Egypt is a very interesting uh, thing to, to, to uh, dissect. Uh, first of all, movement itself was very successful because their overall goal was to get rid of the guy who was riding the country for 26, 27 years, a lovely guy named Hosni Mubarak. And they were terribly effective in achieving their overall goal. Uh, the thing is, uh, you don't mix the movement's goal uh, with what you would love to see for the country. And uh, building democracy, building long-term institutions, and generally transitions from status quo to change are actually the most perilous part of the social change. If you take a look at another important and iconic book, actually probably the best scientific book on nonviolent movements called Why Civil Resistance Works, uh, uh, written by Erika Chenovet and Maria Stefan, two American scholars in 2008, you would be looking into numbers and being pretty enthusiastic, knowing that nonviolent movements are more than twice more successful than the violent movements. And this is through the scope of over a century, the 20th century, these were the cases they were looking at. But when you take a look at whether the change is there five years after the change, so you're looking at the durability of a change. Is, is India still independent state? Is Serbia still democracy? Did you have a democratic transition in place like Ukraine or Egypt? You will figure out that this percent is lower. So absurdly, movements have better chances to grow from 10 people to the millions of people and achieve their projected goal. And they have more chances to fail after Mubarak's of this world have left their office. And this is what ta science teaches us. Also experience teaches us that the main driving forces behind successful nonviolent movements, namely vision, unity, strategy, discipline, are very likely to wane 
once you don't have the bad guy against you. So he, actually having Milosevic or Mubarak, or it may be a collective, like the military junta in Myanmar, once again, it doesn't necessarily need to be a person. But having this big anti-thing that mobilizes people is very helpful for people overcoming their differences, working jointly for the cause. And that probably comes from our cave selves, uh, where we were probably having disputes about where will we be hunting tomorrow or who is going to marry the hairy beauty of the tribe. Uh, but once we have a bear in front of the cave, we were very fast to cooperate in order to get rid of bear. And then once the bear is gone, uh, we were back to our, to our former disputes. Similarly, the constituencies in Egypt, which were crucial for overthrowing Mubarak in early 2011, once again, these were not the people you would, you would expect to see over a tea in a coffee shop secular urban youth, very important in mobilization, very large in numbers. Egypt is an extremely young nation. So you have a, this, this demographic group is huge in numbers. This group between 20 and 30 is probably the largest demographic group in, in most of the Arab countries. And then taking a look in, a, you know, more conservative groups that were largely oppressed, but very well community organized. It's a Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and then you take a look at the military, the third player in a game that was kind of, you know, supportive to Mubarak and then ready to oust Mubarak. It was the military pillar that the protesters sway. Uh, and then this strategic mistake of this urban, secular, progressive people, we were all standing by to say, oh, you know, Mubarak is down. We go back to our jobs and studies and dating and music. And, you know, politics is not for us. And then leaving the transition, very power thirsty groups, namely military and Muslim Brotherhood. And then having eternal battle between these two groups, first dominated by military that set the rules, then dominated by Muslim Brotherhood that successfully won a that, that uh, after that performed another coup and now dominated by a military guy in a suit named, Mo, named, uh, named Sisi, who is even worse uh, when it comes to democracy from the Mubarak. But if you want a permanent change, you need to look behind just one person or just a group of people. You need to look behind only one day in time when this person steps down or the new government is elected and numerous groups across the world learned that lesson the hard way and where you're looking at ukraine where you know the 2003 you had this large orange revolution but then the newly elected elites start behaving like the old elected elites they replace the old tycoons with new tycoons only to fail to the pro-russian influence for another five years and need to do it all over again yeah. in 2008 uh, wherever you look, the transition is actually the shaky part. So planning for building things after the change is what many of these movements lack. And this is where the real devil lies. And also from the point of participation, I can tell this from my personal experience after the Serbian nonviolent revolution or however you name it, uh, defense of the vote in 2000. I went a bit into the government and parliament. I spent year, three years in a Serbian National Assembly as an MP for a ruling democratic coalition. I spent three years of my life advising the first Serbian democratically elected Prime Minister Djindic. Uh, changing things from the inside is uh, actually far slower and far less appealing than, than, than outrunning the police and breathing the tear gas. It all comes with a lovely adrenaline and feeling of being outcast and hero. Sitting in a boring meetings that should produce the institutions that will put more transparency in how the public utilities are buying their, their stuff. This is the most boring job in the world. And I don't blame people who don't want to be involved in this process. But without new people in politics that came involved in politics through the nonviolent movement, 
well, the politics will be dominated by the very people you wanted to oust, or they're from the government or the opposition. History of, of uh, successful pro-democracy movement, just one type of struggle. You have bad government, you want to get rid of this government, often involves movement that builds from the political vacuum between the government and the opposition. And you don't need to take a look further than the, the Indian newspapers. Would any opposition party in India be capable of mobilizing the numbers that were mobilized by farmers' unions? The answer is no. So it is because you have a bad government policy. It is because you have a lack of viable and, and uh, appealing political alternative that these movements blossom in the first place. So it's like it is the vacuum overtaken from the politicians by the people who would not normally not get involved in politics. But once again, we are living in the era of the human capital. How to get these mobilizers involved in institutions is the answer to the question how we will improve the country, where we are talking about the Serbia, India, Egypt, Burma, whatever. Getting people who are running movements involved in a, in a, in a sustainable manner in a long-term policy making. One way to do it, these movements can create parties, parties can go on the elections. Another way to do it, the new government can, can make a broad appeal, involve the parts of the civil society to participate in the reforms. Third answer, these movements can stay as a vigilant watchdog on any new governmental policy. So where you're building it completely from the inside, combination of inside and the outside, or completely from the outside of the existing system, the engagement is the key. You want better politics, you need to bring new people in the politics. Social movements bring new people to the politics. How to make them long-term engaged into politics and policymaking and society? It's a $1 million question. I'm, <laughs> I'm very knowledgeable about the part how to involve these people in a movement where when you have bad politics. I'm probably not the most suitable person to say, oh, you know, these people were great in mobilizing millions and now we have this reform on farms and they just want to go back to their farms. They're not interested in running in local election in whatever Indian province I cannot pronunciate. Punjab. So the tougher question is that how can nonviolence be applied to differences within society? to differences that are not necessarily uh, related to a, a totalitarian or auto autocratic ruler, uh, but which divides society uh, in, in its worst forms in the way that you saw in the uh, fractured Yugoslavia. But we are seeing it in India on the Hindu-Muslim issue. We are seeing it in the US on the race and uh, racism issue. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And uh, go ahead. You, yeah, you one, one, one way, one way, I mean, you're seeing it in US in more ridiculous issues than you can, you can imagine. And, and uh, you know, starting with mask mandates in schools. So it's really like, it's, it's down to the barrel where people are, dig in their trenches, they live in their echo chambers, and they don't listen to each other. And once again, this is a very important phenomenon. We are witnessing the not only the 15 years of democracy decay, but the largest portion of this, we are witnessing a very ineffective political polarization. It is the political polarization which weighed one of the largest projects of the 21st century, EU, uh, crippled from Great Britain. And uh, it is the political polarization that brought us uh, the wonderful people like Trump or Modi, uh, ruling some of the most uh, important countries in the world. So leveraging on this political polarization, uh, uh, spreading hate, and uh, in part understanding that for Kremlin and, and hate emanation, the social media did the same role as the Hollywood did for the end of the Cold War, but now the other side is winning. That's the difference. And uh, the taking a look into uh, all of this 
phenomenon of how social media, social networks should connect us, but actually isolate us in a small rooms where we can be brainwashed, where whether lefty brainwashed or righty brainwashed or ISIS brainwashed or basically brainwashed because the algorithms keep feeding us with the things that we support and keep connecting us only with the like-minded people. And uh, this is something that people who created this thing and, and you should watch Social Dilemma. It's a great Netflix I have, uh, a video. I have. Oh, it's an Very amazing exciting. thing. Like, you, like, like if I'm a religious, I would be thinking that some of the people would be burning in a certain part of hell for those who invented that, like, there must be a certain part of hell. I think Indian, what, what Indian post-mortem life has many locations. We can find a room for these people. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the, our hell has only nine circles. It's very, it's populated. Uh, so the, the taking a look, taking a look into this phenomenon, this is another very important aspect of nonviolent movements. So on one way, you can see that a new breed of nonviolent movements is actually growing on this type of phenomenon. Uh, the largest two sections, if there is this amazing website run by Carnegie Endowment, which is called Protest Tracker. And this is where you can go take a look at the different protests across the world, which kind of indicates you what people are discontent about and what they're ready to act about. And you can also see the topics around which organize because the new breed of world movement is very triggered uh, uh, launched. It's very different than, you know, labor unions want more labor rights. So they form the organization within the factory. From the organization within the factory, they grow into the organization within the industry. From the organization within the industry, they start to influence politics. From that, they move into mobilizing public and local communities, and boom, you have the revolution in Poland. So it's like the, the, this very old fashioned way of organizing within institutions and creating groups within institutions to tackle certain issue looks very different. And whether you want to dissect uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement in US, or you like to dissect Fridays for Future or any given environmental movement across the globe, it's a different game. There is a trigger. The trigger triggers the response. Response is horizontal not vertical because it spreads across the networks very fast. You have the large uh, this, uh, decentralized movement where a lot of people are doing things and claim ownership over things. The ownership is, by the way, the positive part of this phenomenon. The negative part of this phenomenon is lack of structure. So because you have the lack of structure, then the decision-making process is complicated. Clarifying clear demands is complicated. And most important element that I was talking before is this Gandhian, we need to tackle climate change, but we need to end with this one coal plant first, and then the second one, and then the third one. And now we are at 8% of electric cars, and we want to be at 28% of the electric cars in five years. So breaking this big intangible threat, like a climate, climate change, or baking, making, breaking a big systemic racism phenomenon in US, which, you know, it's like one way is to take a look at it and say, we'll put more cameras on the police. So when they stop and frisk people of color, there will be a price tag to pay. But this is solving a cough while you are dying of COVID or lung cancer. So this is, you know, having your little syrup and you're just killing the symptom, but disease kills you constantly. So for these large phenomena, you need a multi-pillar strategy. You need to know how to affect the different parts of the society. There needs to be a working groups, the programs, the experts. And the fact that we are having some kind of, of at least global movement within the governments around the environment tells you how difficult this road is and how much it takes from just people protesting because of you know their land is flooded due to the dam all the way to having a functional environmental protection agency uh, within, the, within the, the government with the budget and plans and programs and impact assessments and rules and regulation. It's a very, once again, back to Gandhi, from salt to kick Brits out of it. It's a very long, it's a marathon. Yeah. And there are a lot of, a lot of boring steps 
yeah. in this one. There are some exciting steps, but there are a lot of boring steps in this marathon. Mm -hmm. To go back to your question, yeah. to go back okay. to your question of polarization, I think movements uh, have uh, outsized impact in putting the issues on agenda. The way the polarization works is that uh, they are the the whoever wants the polarization. Let's say I'm a right wing nuts. It's a difficult role to play, but I'll try to play it. I'll play a role of left wing nuts in three minutes. So here you are in the U.S. and you're right wing nut, and that comes with a certain identity. You idolize the 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 defeated president of the United States. You say elections were fraudulent. So you don't recognize them. You don't wear mask. You don't want to vaccinate. You hate the the Fauci, who is the head of the CDC. Uh, you read QAnon, you believe everything is conspiracy. You think that the government is there to take your freedoms, uh, including your gun and your right to, to infect everybody with COVID by, by not being vaccinated, but that's your right. So it's like, it's a rights thing. You have the right not to be vaccinated and kill other people. You have the right not to wear mask. You have the right to wear assault weapon and eventually get it to the, your kid's hands so he or she can get to school and kill fewer her peers. But at the same time, that freedom doesn't apply to women who wants to abortion. So we will cancel the right to abortion because we are pro-life. So in a way, we are killing life, but at the same time, we are pro-life. And that may sound crazy when I put it this way, but this is the beliefs of this uh, very large group of people. And how you break into these beliefs is not by saying these beliefs are ridiculous, they are not based on... And by the way, the, the, the climate change is a Chinese hoax. It doesn't really exist. It is the invention of the big corporations. I live in Colorado Springs, which is America in small, uh, went 52% for Trump. So this is like, a, you know, I'm half-half. I'm meeting liberals and conservatives every day. And uh, the way you build around these things is finding the common ground. So like we had a hurricane here five days ago, everything was flying. We have the driest winter in the history of, of, of this country. Uh, we didn't have snow and it's 20th of December and I'm on, on 1800 meters. So I live on the top of the mountain. This is where the city is built. The whole Colorado is mile high, but there is no snow. And the earth is absolutely dry. So even the shortest wind will take the big trees and throw them on the houses and stuff like that. So once you have a phenomenon like that, then you can use this trigger, go back to the movements and take a look at A, how you can leverage this in terms of communication, making people who deny climate change uh, uh, the fact that, you know, do you remember December with no snow in Colorado? Nobody remembers December with no snow. Maybe there was one 50 years ago when I was not even born. And then you look at the real damage, the real financial burden to the people, the fact the schools were closed for, for almost a week, uh, two weeks ago, because of the, of the weather and because of the draft. So now you can leverage this in many different directions. On a communication level, you build a whole story around it and then you play through the local media. On the organizing level, you can organize people in solidarity of people who were hit by the natural disaster. You can organize the people to name and shame state representatives that were not quick. Well, they were quick here, amazingly quick. It's like, I must say, I hate my local government, but they, they were very good at it. And uh, uh, the, the third level is let's count the trees that went down in Colorado Springs, probably 300 of them. I, th I think somebody did a little bit of a count, very old, beautiful trees. And let's mobilize around replanting these trees and restructuring this thing. Now we are talking something that can bring people from different parts of the spectrum because community and everyday life, and it's their streets where these trees were falling. And they're seeing this every day. It's not a very big city. It's half a million people. So it's like, a, it's not Delhi. So who gives a shit? If something happens at the border of Delhi, you are living in a, like Delhi is bigger than Serbia. And uh, taking a look at these at these community-based initiatives, 
where you can assemble people around the issue that tackle their everyday life. And then through doing things which are good for community, with good not being disputable by the ideologies or identities. or So you're putting a non-divisive issue in the middle of the process, and then you build a kind of the movement and small projects and tangible victory. So first we will clean up the shit from the streets. And the next thing you know, we will replant the trees and then we'll make a fund which will maintain the trees on the public surfaces. And by the way, there are 30 people who lost their homes, what we are going to do with these people. So you play on this community empathy, which just the fact that, you know, I don't want to help this person whose house was broken by the tree because, you know, he's anti-abortion and I'm a pro-abortion. So that makes no sense. So taking a look at how you can find topics which connect people, identify these topics, mobilize people working on these topics, and then either invite institutions in a, in a better way, they, the institutions would be clever to jump on it because this produces the common gold and good and make politicians easier. This is what they care for or force institutions to do something about it if they don't give a shit and they should be giving a shit. So it's like, whatever is a, is a, is a way to do it. Yeah. This is where you, but first thing is to understand that you need to find non-divisive issues. So this is tough because yeah. the people who are socially proactive are already locked in their rooms and they're locked in their chamber rooms. And if this would be a call with my beloved American liberals, which tend to be the big fans of my work in my book, I would probably be warned and dismissed by a bunch of them because my name on the screen is Sergei Popovich. It doesn't say he, him. So somehow wearing your, your sexual identity as a badge becomes a uh, you know, the pass to the certain part. Of, if you don't do it, you're not allowed. Yeah. So they wouldn't even listen to somebody who is not ready to comply yeah. to something that I find very divisive. And now, now oh. once again, you expect these people to be first to jump on the ship yeah. and save the city from, uh, from environmental disaster. You would expect these people to be first to say, oh, the city government run by conservatives, it's, it's, they did a lousy job. You expect these people to be first to say, oh, this is the climate change. And by the way, we need to replant the trees because which is the, this is where they are ideologically stand. But they waste their time in talking about how many angels can you put on the top of the needle and how many signs, male, female, gender neutral, you can put on a bathroom. This is what they're wasting their time. So it's yeah. like taking a look at, you know, how they, they, the, these bulk of active people, whether you ideologically agree with them or you ideologically disagree with them, if you take a look at what they are spending time, once again, they are in echo chambers. So yeah. taking them out of these chambers, showing them the house and saying, okay, you want to talk climate change? This is fucking climate change happening in your own yard. What do we do? about this what is the irrigation and then going to the right and going to the rural colorado where people are still growing cattle on ranches and they're losing ranches because there is no rain and if there is no rain there is nothing for cattle to eat yeah. but the big corporations that have money can come to the farm irrigate the farm and still grow cattle so what happens in the most conservative parts of the state is that the very people who live there and whose grandfathers own the farm there are losing their farms. And they're losing their farms to the big corporations, which they hate because they read QAnon. And no, this is the large world conspiracy of cabal crap. And by the way, climate change is host. Wait, 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 wait a second. It's not a host, it's a draft. And the draft is killing my cattle and will make me eventually sell my farm and change the way of life of my grandfathers. So maybe I will be listening. Maybe I can do something about the climate change, starting with replacing my, my five miles per gallon tractor with something that consumes less oil. So taking a look at these things, once again, 
they need to be local, they need to be tangible. And I agree, it is very, very difficult to put these issues on the radar screen because everybody is looking away of yeah. these issues, but it's possible. And you have chance to do this every day, unfortunately, in, especially when it comes to the climate change. We, ha we, ha we have no lack of opportunities where nature will tell us, oh, guys, you're screwing the planet. This is what I'm going to do about you. Yeah. You know, I was just, as you were talking about the social dilemma and then about the cultural shifts also that have happened in the last few years, I was wondering how you keep Canvas going. Now, that's the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategy. You set it up in 2003. Uh, so it's almost 20 years old now. And in actually, this is a 20-year period in which maybe more technological, social, and uh, to some extent, cultural change has happened at a speed and at a pace that really human brains were really not designed for, right? I mean, evolution didn't prepare us for such a speed and magnitude of, of change. So how do you hold this, uh, how do you hold Canvas together in such a difficult time? Well, I mean, Canvas is small, uh, flexible, six people, 12 external consultants, nonprofit based out of Belgrade. So it's relatively cheap to maintain in terms of survival. And uh, the, how, we, how we adapted to the world uh, uh, is A, uh, we had from being basic, our basic product is we produce workshops in movement building for the, we started with pro-democracy groups and then expanded into anti-corruption groups and accountability groups and human rights groups. And lately we did a lot of case studies and workshops and learned a lot and developed a whole branch of program for environmental groups. Because obviously there is a huge demand on, on this side of the, of the world's movement. Second part, we cope with the science. Uh, we think that uh, once again, environment didn't become the world's problem number one by the bunch of, of enthusiastic hippies tying themselves for the fences of the nuclear power plant in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It became effective when it was coped with institutions and science and got into mainstream politics. And we want the theory of nonviolent struggle to become the part of the curriculum of the universities. And this year, uh, only I taught six university courses in various institutions across the globe, mostly online, some of them in, in is, person. Is that what has taken you to Colorado? Are, are you teaching in Colorado? Originally, or, yeah, I teach at Colorado College at UC Boulder, which is another big university, just uh, two hours drive. That that in part was was the reason why I live here. Now, uh, aside of the fact it's a great place for living and raising kids, uh, the the you want to you, if you take a look at the Air Visual app on your phone, you will understand that Colorado Springs is today seven times better air quality than Belgrade, where I lived before, and probably 13 times better than Delhi. So it's like the, the, the but taking a look at the, at the, at this scope, we worked a lot on this. We did a lot of research. We kind of teamed up with the people who are real scientists instead of trying to obtain PhDs. So we tried to expand into this higher education world. Lastly, we, we moved online. Uh, we were, we were blessed to teach an online course in Harvard, 2000. 12, I think, starting 2013, maybe. So for the five years, we were giving our workshop in one of the world's most prestigious universities through Zoom. So when the COVID hit, we already have the product ready for delivery online with, without thinking that maybe we will need it one day. So last year, we probably did, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 different workshops for group across the world. And uh, we are also trying to adapt to this new breed of the social movements and trying to figure out how, because what we teach is a, is a side of being just set of tools and, and skills. 
uh, you're looking at a philosophy which comes with understanding phenomenon of mobilization, following the mobilization with the organization, then bringing the change to the next level where you can capitalize on the next wave of mobilization because you're already having some kind of organization. And if you imagine, well, mobilization is a very water-like phenomenon. It comes in waves or in tides, if you want, or in seasons, if you live in India. And... Uh, but the organization is more like stairs. So this is this Gandhi, first salt, and then this, and then shirts, and then this, and this, and then first Punjab, and then this, and then this, and then this. And uh, taking a look into, into, this is actually the challenge we are looking the most. We are looking at what may be the best blueprint for building some kind of organization decision-making process in a growingly decentralized and uh, social media connected ecosystem of the movements. So you have this BLM thing, it's triggered by the, by the event. You have it happening all over the United States. You have uh, people who are in no means affected, meaning black suburban citizens of Colorado Springs, having big garden signs claiming BLM, and by the way, they're white. Uh, uh, we have only 4% of, of Black people in, in Colorado Springs. But you still have outsized participation. So how do you capitalize on this? What is the organizational aspect of the fact that people care about the systemic racism? <laughs> so how do you cope this theory of mobilization should be followed with the organization in the age where People think that, you know, organization, board, strategy, it's a corporate bullshit that they don't want to apply on whatever they are, they are doing. So, so these are some of the challenges that, that we all face. Also challenge of, the, of this human touch and physical activist chemistry. I'll give you the examples. Like uh, this year I flew twice, uh, one to Serbia for a summer vacation and once to the largest world assembly of dissidents called Oslo Freedom Forum. Any single year before COVID, I would be spending 100,000 miles in the air. So my normal interaction with physical activists or students was 90 days a year, and now it's all online. So it's like, you know, these are some challenges that you need to cope with, but but this is what it is. Well, also, we keep hoping that, that this part is temporary. I mean, we don't know, but that's the hope. Yes and no. I think one of the good things that, that COVID really, really forced us to do is to, to create products that can be delivered without large time and money travel expenses. And I don't look at it necessarily as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The fact that that I can deliver, uh, uh, you know, the whole portion of Canvas Workshop made into the four weeks, and that's eight to ten two-hour sessions now. And this product itself, I mean, we call it product in the organization, costs maybe fifteen thousand dollars now. So the whole thing, all you need to do is to fundraise for 15K and you have the full workshop as opposed to bringing 20 people from place A to the hotel in a place B, renting the hotel in a place B, feeding people over the course of a week or two, flying canvas trainers uh, to that place probably three times. So it's in terms of cost effectiveness, this thing really, really improved the way that we are able to work with the groups. And because we are the small organization and because we normally works with the groups that don't have a lot of money, uh, we increase the outreach because now we need to find a way with these groups to fundraise for a smaller amount of money to get a thing done as opposed to fundraise for a larger amount of money. And also that amount of money can come faster which is very important because normally when you seek the doctor's advice, it's when you have symptoms and you don't feel well. Normally when people reach to the canvas, it's on the peak or all the beginning of the mobilization. Yeah. So giving people skills 
timely is of essence rather than fundraising for a year and then getting with people when mobilization is already dead and they need to build from the scratch. I'm so, just telling you a little bit of my industry problems, but yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it makes sense. Um, I'm sure that there is an element of the face to face interaction, which is irreplaceable, but uh, certainly a great deal of the prep, as you have uh, described, can happen uh, using these technologies. Um, so in closing, I wanted to ask you how you remain, if not optimistic, at least you do seem to defy pessimism, uh, you know, because you have written in your book that Serbs don't do optimism. And yet here you are quite defiantly anti-pessimistic. Uh, so one is that, you know, what is your secret? How did you, and because I think it's because you're not pessimistic that you're able to come up with a concept like laughtivism as a form I of- think the, the, I think the, I think the, the, the like one thing uh, that is on a very philosophical level, there were bleak uh, times in the history of humanity and there were no lack of them. Some of them, like uh, dark mid ages were sparked by a complete domination of one pillar, namely church over the largest portion of societies preventing every kind of, of growth. But then the Renaissance came later. Uh, one of them, the first world war, second world war, all of these conflicts in, in Europe started as a clash of, of nasty ideologies and uh, well, basically three ideologies, liberal capitalism, communism, and, and national socialism or fascism, and ending up in a, in a, in a world's largest conflict, uh, two atomic bombs, concentration camps, uh, but ended in a new era of growth. So what history teaches us that, that human beings are likely to adapt to, to the crap they, they tend to produce and they're likely to find a way out. Uh, so socially, talking about the polarization, democracy, decay, and uh, especially the assault of truth, which is the very important part of this, of this thing, I think we'll figure it out. Uh, I'm not sure we'll figure it out with climate change, right? Maybe, maybe this is irreversible thing. So I'm not, not I'm, though I'm cautiously optimistic about where the society goes, I'm kind of less optimistic of how seriously we are taking the fact that we are destroying a big and very inert system. So it's very difficult to reverse this change. Uh, far, far more difficult than rebuilding democracy after you know having a bad guy in power for four or five years. It's doable. Uh, second, uh, on a very personal level, I. You know, I work with risk takers. I work with people who still have hope in places like Mali or Uganda or Burma or Nicaragua, where everybody else lost hope. And working with the people who have hope in these places and ready to take the action. And just to remind you, the action in these places means you're risking your life. So these are the serious risk takers, meaning that you're working with the best part of the society. And once again, uh, uh, quoting somebody who is more wise than me, Benjamin Franklin said, there are three portions of each society. There are those unmovable, there are those movable, and there are those who move. And working, educating, helping those who move, this is what I do for a living. And uh, the, the fact that I'm interacting with people like that probably keeps me sane and keeps me optimistic and keeps me energized because these people are more committed than I am. They're very often smarter than I am and they are taking the larger risks than I have taken in my lifetime or would take in my future life. So, you know, working with them kinds of inspires you and, and keeps you young and keeps you on the top of the things. So it's kind of a, of a booster. Uh, despite the bleak outlook of the of where the world is go, going globally. But this pendulum is coming back. I mean, politically, you can see the pendulum is coming you think back. It, and COVID will help. 
COVID will help. Keeping That's guys like COVID, because... COVID took Trump, COVID took, took Trump from power. COVID is contributing to the some of the worst populists losing power in Europe. Uh, 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 some of the worst populists will losing power but, in Latin America. Georgia, Eventually, think... it will knock on the doors of Orban and Erdogan and Modi, yeah. because you can't tweet your way out. You need to deliver. That's the main point with large natural disasters, and I see pandemic as a large natural disaster, is that when rubber hits the road, it's people demand accountability from their governments on delivery. Not on propaganda, not on language, not on ideology, not on religion, but you know, if I get sick, is there a hospital bed? If I get scared that I get sick, can I get tested? If I want to get vaccinated, can I get the access to the vaccine? So once again, back to the farms, back to the trees, back to the, to the hurricane here in Colorado Springs, the real mobilization point of normally politically indifferent people comes when the trigger hits your family. So whenever it, when it becomes personal, it's very difficult to 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 uh, brainwash people, and the whole theory of of nonviolent change actually relates on the fact that if discontent, there is a certain portion of people that will demand change, and whether or not they will be capable to develop strategy, unity, vision, and all the other requirements to achieve it, it's yet another question. But but people people will be angry. People will demand answers and then people will shake some of the of the worst regimes of this world as we've seen in belarus last year and once again it's COVID. so it's, it's the way the government wasn't capable to respond and this will elevate the discontents and participation this can overcome the media control manipulation propaganda and troll farms and this will eventually kick Bolsonaro out of power in Brazil. So it's like taking a look at the consequences, they will come in a cascade. But but once again, we are witnessing the creeping, creepy disaster of the of the of the of the crawling disaster of the climate change, but galloping disaster of COVID. And faced with disaster, people are looking to the state and how the elected people are responding to this, and they expect response, which is a part of the social contract people sign when they decide to live in the state and go on the elections and follow traffic regulations and pay taxes and whatever else we are doing as a part of this contract. But in this contract, the state's obligation is to defend us. And if they don't, we get angry. So thank you so much. Thank you and namaste and all the best.